Please welcome Moment's Editor-in-Chief and co-founder of the Moment Gallery, Nadine Epstein. Thank you so much for joining us. We love art here at Moment, and we know so many fabulous artists. So we decided to launch this The Moment Gallery, and it's focused mostly on women's art, but we'll have men's art as well. And we have some beautiful art for sale. It's starting with our future artists who we're going to meet today, Judy Greenberg and Simonita Youth. And we'll be adding more artists as the year goes on. Um, you could actually buy art online. Our art is for sale. It's very accessible, it's easy. You go to momentmag.com slash gallery. The chat, the address is in the chat box so you can see it right there. And you can click on the art. You can always make the art larger so you can see it. It's really beautiful. We're very proud of it. And you can buy art right online or you can also call John Araskin, 202-363-6422 uh, or email her at jraskin at momentmag.com. And it's very important to know that the proceeds support the artists and also our very important work here at the Moment Magazine. We have a lot of people who put this project together and have been working for a year to make this happen. Robin Strongen, who you're going to meet, she's the owner of the new Strongen Collection in Georgetown on Wisconsin Avenue in Washington, D.C. You'll be hearing from her. And Diane Bowles. Diane Bowles is also on the gallery team. She was the editor, arts editor of the Smithsonian Magazine based in DC, and she's Moments Arts Editor and now, and she's amazing. And John Araskin, who you'll talk to when you call, who's also wonderful and very friendly. Um, I'd like to actually start by, there's so much gonna happen today, so I don't wanna take a lot of time, but I wanna introduce you to uh, Robin, Robin Strong, and she's founder of the Strongman Collection. Previously, she co-founded the Center for Contemporary Political Art in Washington, D.C., and she created the award-winning Disruptive Women in Healthcare blog. She is the first board chair of the Bulanger Initiative, a nonprofit promoting music composed by women, and she served on the board of the Institute for Music and Neurologic Function, which is founded by Oliver Sacks, and, it was an, and she was an advisor for the Foundation of Art and Healing. And she is my co-conspirator and co-founder um, of this wonderful project. And Robin, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you. I'm just as excited as you are, Nadine, and um, very, very grateful, Judy, to you and to Simonita, who um, is not on the video right now, but I know we'll get her back shortly, and Ori as well. Um, and we have quite a bit to go over today, so I'm just going to take a very brief moment to run through how we've structured today. It's essentially a series of conversations and an opportunity for everybody um, listening to be able to ask questions, of course, and you'll be able to type your questions um, in the box that's at the bottom of your screen. We're going to kick off with um, some remarks um, and an overview of um, a sampling of the work by Judy uh, Greenberg and by Simonita. And then we'll have a conversation, the three of us, about their work. And then we will be joined by Professor Soltes, Ori Soltes from Georgetown. And then we'll open it up to a conversation with the four of us, and then we'll take your questions. So we'll have a lot of art, a lot of conversation, and um, hopefully interaction with all of you with some of your questions and thoughts. For those of you who may not be um, as familiar with art, we're very sensitive to that, and we've, um, we will not use terms without explaining what they mean. So not to worry, we, we welcome folks with all backgrounds, artistic or otherwise. So without further ado, um, I would also like to thank the team that, that helped us get to here today. And um, with that, I'd like to introduce Judy Greenberg. Um, Judy was appointed director of the Krieger Museum back in January 1994, and she's really done a, an amazing amount um, during her tenure there. Uh, probably too many things for me to go over, but we do have her full bio on 
uh, the moment website uh, on the gallery page. But a few highlights um, that I want to mention today, back in December 2000, Judy was nominated as a finalist for the Mayor's Arts Award for Excellence in Service to the Arts, which really is DC's highest honor in the arts that can be conferred on an individual. She also initiated Colorfield Remix, which is, um, was meant to pay homage to the critically acclaimed Washington Color School um, back from the 50s and 60s. And her last project before she retired from the Krieger Museum was to develop their um, sculpture garden. And it's just breathtaking. If you haven't had an opportunity to visit the sculpture garden, I encourage you to do so, especially with the weather getting a little bit cooler now. And fortunately for us and for the Moment Gallery, Judy is a practicing artist and continues to um, create. And she uh, learned her art, just studied studio art at NYU in, in New York City. And without further ado, Judy, I'm gonna ask you to start um, to share some of your work with us. Thank you, Robin, and thank you, Nadine. It is a pleasure to be part of this. And Simonita, wonderful meeting you. I'm glad we are sharing the screen together. And I will also look forward to seeing my old friend, Ori. So this should be a lovely uh, and interesting hour. Um, I guess one of the things, because Robin mentioned that I had retired from the Krieger, which I did, in 2017, um, and it was an amazing experience for me. And it also, I, I like to say that when I was at the Krieger, I was still had, that being an artist was still in me. It was in me before I began, it was in me, all of the programs that I developed, I always felt they were a little off the grid, not necessarily um, things that have been done before. And once I retired, which was 2017, I became involved with the Center for Contemporary Political Art with Robin. And at that point, I really decided I wanted to get into my own work and do it full time, which I started doing. And um, I picked out four pieces to show you, four collages, because I felt it was a good representation of the work I did over a three year period. Mind you, I did many more than, than, than four. It's just that I chose four because I thought it would be uh, interesting for you to see how I worked and what was in my mind in creating something. So the first work that I'd like to focus on is After the Hamptons. Um, I mentioned that I, or oh, Robin mentioned, that I was developing the uh, sculpture garden at the Krieger Museum. In doing so, uh, many summers I spent traveling around and visiting various sculpture parks. One of my visits uh, was when I was in East Hampton and I found this small sculpture park. It was in a wooded area right outside of the village. Um, and I had never been there before, although I'd been to the Hamptons in many, many, for many, many years. And I was taken by the work. So fast forward, here I am retired. And I'm going through a number of, um, I, I look at art in America most of the time for images, because they have wonderful images of artwork. But I don't take these images and copy these in images, and I don't take them as full images. I cut them up, I rip them, and they inspire me to take other st steps in developing what I'm working on. So in this particular work, After the Hamptons, you'll see it was done in 2019. In the center is where there's a piece of one of the sculptures that was in the garden. From there, I develop the rest of my composition. And I like to refer to myself as an abstract expressionist because I really work from the gut. Whatever I'm a feeling it is coming out. And I also am exceedingly conscious of the composition. 
and how that composition flows. And I want to point out something to you. When you're looking at this, you're going to see there's a large sort of an arc in orange or reddish orange. And then there's, there's another form. I want you to notice that because when I show you the next three collages, you'll understand why I'm telling you this. This particular collage is actually, it is very landscape oriented. It has some architectural features, but it's, it's done with pieces of paper or magazine and glued. And the beauty of collage for me is if I'm working on it and I'm not satisfied with something, I just merely paste right over what I was working on and I redirect it. But I also like sort of the element of surprise in what I'm finding in the images that I'm taking out. The next that I will talk to you about was done in 2020. Remember I said I want you to look and to, and to notice the area on the top of the previous collage, the, the reddish orange just sort of arc. Well, notice what you've got. Yeah, see, notice what you've got here. I don't do this consciously. It just sort of comes out of me. It's, it's needed for the composition. Now this composition is exceedingly different from the previous one. Why? First of all, it's much more um, hard edge. You'll see most of the images are cut, whereas in the other collage, some of them are ripped and ripping it gives it a softer, um, a sort of a feeling that you want to be touching it. I don't want to be touching this collage. This is a collage that I find quite frightening and emotional. And I gave you the date, I said 2020. That was when we were in the height of the previous administration. And I was extremely fearful. I had no idea what this country was coming to. And this was my way of expressing it. Then we go on to another composition where again, you see this top part. I'm not sure why. Maybe I should ask like a psychiatrist to tell me why I do that but I'd like to think that I'm enclosing it. I'm keeping a lid on it. And it also gives, it, it takes you around. And I said to you, the composition, composition is most important to me. This, I was going through again, uh, it was probably Art in America, it could have been another uh, magazine. And I saw this figure of a woman and I cut it out. That's what inspired me through the entire work, the solitude, and again, a bit of fear and an architectural feeling and a little bit more uh, minimal than some of the previous works that you just looked at. From there, we go to the last that I've chosen. And I hope when you look at this, you think good things and you smile because that's the way I felt. And this was the one collage that I will tell you, I probably had a preconceived notion of what I wanted to do. Most of the time, my work just, it, it comes out of me. And, and then I'm, whatever I happen to be working on uh, with whatever collage piece that I've cut out or ripped out, I, I develop my, composition from that and I build on it. This is done the same way, but this I knew I wanted to rejoice because I was so uneasy about what was going on, as I said before, and the inauguration. And once that inauguration happened, all I could think of was the sun was going to shine and we're going to have things floating up in the air, firecrackers or whatever, and light comes to us. And again, I have that arm on the top, which again, I'm just analyzing it myself. You may have a different interpretation, 
but it keeps it keeps me in. And I guess that's it of the four collages. So if anyone has any questions or Robin, you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. So um, thank you, Judy, very much. One thing I would ask is um, you mentioned uh, the word, you mentioned abstract expressionism. And I wonder if you might want to share a little bit about what you mean by that. I know it was an art movement post-World War II that started in New York City, but maybe just say a very brief a bit about it for those who might not be familiar. Certainly. Actually, um, as Robin mentioned, I, I studied studio art at New York University, and that was in the mid-60s. And all we heard about was abstract expressionism. Of course, there were other movements like hard edge that were going on, pop art was going on, but living in New York and being surrounded by de Kooning, Motherwell, Jackson Pollock, these were all the abstract expressionists. Okay, so how do I describe that? It's really letting your gut come out and you are working on to whatever you're working on, whether it's a canvas or it's a, a board of some sort or it's a sculpture. It, it's, it's an emotional reaction that, and, and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't have a subject necessarily. Um, some do have subjects, but I mean, it, I, the easiest thing for me to say is think of Jackson Pollock because everybody is familiar with his work. And he threw, he threw the paint down. Throwing the paint down, I guarantee you, he was very careful with where he was throwing it and what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. So even though it may seem like things are all like, oh, I could do that. No, you can't do that. Did you do it? You didn't do it. He did it. Um, but anyway, that's abstract expressionism. And I was so influenced by it because oh, many of my professors at the school were um, abstract expressionists. And, I, and Irving Sandler, who was a, a big art uh, critic and, and historian, he uh, was one of my professors, you know. So I was very much involved in that Great. world it, to some extent. Great, and we'll pick up on that thread when we, um, after Simonita has a chance to run through hers because there's a nice juxtaposition between your work and Simonita's work. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce Simonita um, to um, be able to share the work that she has created really specifically for the Moment Gallery. And um, Simonita hails from a long line of artists. She herself has graduated from, um, with her undergraduate degree, she went to the School for Industrial Design in the graphic department, um, at the University of Fine Arts in Belgrade. She earned her master's degree in Byzantine monumental art. And after she moved to the United States, Simonita worked at Dumbart Noakes. She was a mosaic artist at St. Sophia Cathedral here in Washington, DC. And she served as the last apprentice to the master mosaicist, Dimitri Dukas. Um, she's done many, many, many other things here in DC, but in particular, I do want to mention that she spent a great deal um, of time as an art director and executive producer of documentaries that have been shown all over on PBS, and in fact, two of them were awarded with uh, National Emmy Awards. She's just an amazing artist, and uh, to say she does a lot of research with her work is um, an understatement. It's a pleasure to hear you talk about what goes into the works that you do, Simonita, and I'm really looking forward to hearing you describe for us a little bit about the four works that you have chosen. So uh, take it away, Simonita. Okay, um, hello everybody. Um, um, hello, my friends. Um, I wanted to actually start with saying how I came upon thinking and doing my series of the Jerusalem Gate. Um, since I'm entire my life spending in the um, area of art and I have been following what's going on 
constantly, I realized that I wanted to put a little bit more meaning, uh, not quite to do the protest art, but to actually take and uh, put direction of the art appreciators into a very important political and um, cultural, actually, um, uh, places. Um, for me, Jerusalem was always the belly button of the Western civilization. And it fascinates me in many ways. It started with uh, some of the photos that I enjoy to watch, which are um, drone photos or satellite photos. And looking at the Suleiman Magnificent, or as they call him, Suleiman who give the law, um, I was looking at the city and it looked like a, like a human cell. And all the important places looked like a nucleus. And the wall was the membrane. And of course, how, does, how do I get ideas? Reading books. So I studied quite a lot uh, the gates, the building, the history actually going all the way to Neolith, believe it or not. But along the way, I felt the magic of the place, uh, the type of the stone, um, uh, melek or mleko, or it's a limestone that when it's cut, it becomes harder and harder and harder and the color changes into milk white. It's a very, very interesting uh, stone and the way how they did the, the, the gates and everything. So, but more important than talking about the history that we all can, can look, this is what inspired me. Um, it's a layers and layers of history of different types. I'm going to talk about symbolism of Jerusalem and the gates. I wanted to open desperately a new door, a new gate uh, to a little bit better future, to a future that, you know, gives possibility and opportunity for all of us to enjoy the heritage. It is, it is Earth, Mother Earth's heritage. And um, especially what intrigued me was, how to say, when you open a new door, you open a new possibilities. Also by doing the research, I have noticed uh, that there were many, many times of the wars, of course, as we know, the, the, the Crusades, the, the Byzantine, the Greeks, the Persians, things changed almost like a wind. But you know, when was always the peace and harmony in that city? when people were doing business, <laughs> when everybody was thinking about trade, about bringing from Far East, from Africa, from Greece, from all over. It's truly a very, very interesting and fascinating place. I don't know how to shrink everything in a five, five minutes, but um, this was for me great inspiration. Another great inspiration is after working a lot with oil paintings and things, I wanted to go back to some of the traditional medium, uh, like oil pastel, like ink, Chinese ink, like um, aguaya shell, metal leaf, um, and doing the masters in Byzantine art. Of course, uh, I worked with all the materials and I wanted to incorporate them. Um, I have three more gates to finish. Um, if you don't mind actually Susan showing the gates, we can start with Jaffa Gate, which is kind of the most, uh, uh, shall I say, the most written upon or the most viewed. It's a, it's a, a pathway actually between Jerusalem and Jaffa port. So as I mentioned before, it's a very important trade gate. But there is something that took a lot of my research and attention and I didn't get all the answers I wanted to know. Uh, Jeris there are three Jerusalem gates that are very uniquely L-shaped. Why? It's for better protection against the attackers. Because when you have to turn 
carrying your weapon mostly to the right side. When you turn in, you actually have a very, very, you're very vulnerable and you're totally exposed to another counterattack. So um, these three L-shaped gates, one is uh, Zion, which is um, another uh, important gate, Jaffa gate, and the Lion gate. The Lion gate, was later um, turned from uh, L-shaped gate into a regular because of the traffic. They just uh, avoided all that uh, going on. And um, uh, which one I would talk the most? The Eastern gate is very rich in history. Um, it's called also Golden Gate. It has truly a fascinating uh, layers from um, Herodian times, from um, uh, Justinian times, from, uh, and then the Suleiman Magnificent in 1538, of course, when he gave to his um, architects a deed to, to create the protection wall with the gates and everything. Um, he added and changed a little bit the Byzantine influence that was shown on the gate. Um, one of the reasons why there are some gates that I painted with, um, with the city in the background is that love of mine of the, the bird view, um, seeing accumulating more of the atmosphere. Um, I'm not I, I end up looking like an emotional painter, but I'm actually a little bit different than Judy. I do not use emotion for painting, but I, I use my instinct. Uh, I use um, my inspiration from the books. Uh, all my books are really scribbled on. <laughs> uh, they're not for resale. <laughs> so, um, one of the, the things that um, I liked about the gates is mixing, mixing media to give more of that atmosphere and magic of sunset, sunrise, uh, heat of the yara, the, the heat of the, 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 the summer, the heat of temperature. Um, that's pretty much it. If anybody has any uh, uh, question, anything, I would be very happy to answer. Okay, thank you, Simonita. I also, um, before we open it up to um, have Judy come back, I think there were a few questions about dimensions of the artwork. Um, and I'll mention that Simonita's gates, the work that's up there now are all 18 by 24 inches and Judy's collages are 16 by 20 inches. All of that information, as well as the, the medium, uh, media, I should say, are also listed on, on the website. And that's actually a really good segue to um, ask you a follow-up question be, uh, while Judy gets uh, back on the screen. Um, Simonita, you have actually pioneered a couple of techniques, new techniques that you're using in some of these gate pieces that you've worked on. And you know, very briefly, if you want to share a little bit, because you really are experimenting not just with the gate itself, but the materials that you're using. And it's interesting to, to, to me, I hope to others, you know, why would an artist want to experiment different techniques? Is, is, is that part of, how does that fit into your creative process and what you're trying to express um, with that? Well, every person has its own traits and interests. And, and um, um, for me, I like to be excited. Um, uh, since I was little, I was playing with alchemy, uh, literally. I also contacted Marie-Louise von Franz in Switzerland um, after reading the book on alchemy that she wrote. Uh, she was a director and co-worker with Carl Gustav Jung. 
uh, on symbolism. She was his translator from all the classic languages because he was the largest collector of the alchemical texts in the world. Um, so I was so happy and excited that she answered to me and maybe meeting interesting people like that and talking to them inspired me and gave, gave me a courage. Um, I recently stumbled on um, upon Agoya shell. And of course, we know that in nature, there are hundreds and thousands of different um, colors, um, and uh, nuances, and actually also the shell, the calcium deposit, how it builds, it builds depending on environment and other uh, influences in a different style. So I noticed there was an agua shell that has inside black line uh, that is identical to calligraphy or nervousness of my, my line when I'm doing ink. I love to let my hand free. I, I really, uh, I pour it all out, you know, and my line is just a subconsciousness capture of my toy. It, it's, it's really something to do with all the things I read and my perception of the reality that I see. So I realized that these shells actually are very much in harmony to my line uh, and to my uh, perspective, my, my, my shape of the drawings and things. And that's how I started using them. I'm also uh, great. Um, yeah. Great. All right. Thank you. And I think, thank you, Simonita. I think Judy is back on. And um, there was a question that came in, Judy, that I wanted to um, ask to you because it's related to something which is, um, you know, how was it going from all those years in the museum to becoming back full time to the work that you're doing now? Um, and then after that, we're going to move on to Ori, who has joined us. And um, I'm going to have you answer, Judy. And then Ori is going to take all of the work that we've heard so far and bring it back up to how works of these natures and throughout history um, modern, going all the way back into time, Simonita, you called it the Jerusalem, the belly button of Western civilization, how we tie all of this together. So Judy, just super fast, how, how has that transition been for you from going in the museum to into the studio? Um, it's a very interesting question, Robin. And I remember people saying to me, those that have retired, take some time, don't jump into things, just take some time. I was always interested in um, writing screenplays. So one of the things I started doing was working on a screenplay. And then I was working on a memoir. And then I thought, uh, no, I have to pick up that pen <laughs> and that pencil and I have to start my scribbling. And that's really, it, that brought me into it. I realized that that's, that's what, what I wanted to come out of me and, and where I belonged. I have to respond to something Samanita said, which I think is interesting. You were talking about line. Well, one of the things, and, it, and this has to do really with emotion, abstract expressionism. I'm using that term, so maybe people that are not that comfortable with it or understanding of it. One of the things that a professor of mine stressed was line. And that line should live and it should breathe on its own. And I, I work that way, or you can't always see it, especially if it's, I'm not drawing, but it's, it's done in a different way. But Samanita, that's what you're doing too. I mean, you, that line is expressing a mood or something in you and it's alive. It's not just straight. It's and that is the perfect, Judy, that's perfect because I now wanna bring Ori into the conversation because it's that really that line through all of these works and the line through history, we go way back. And I really can't think of anyone better to tie this all together for us than um, Professor Soltis. So let me just quickly introduce 
um, Dr. Ori Soltis, who is the Goldman Pro uh, Professorial Lecturer in Theology and Fine Arts at Georgetown, where um, he teaches across a very wide range of disciplines covering theology, art history, philosophy, political history. He speaks, reads, and writes uh, something like nine languages, including Hebrew, uh, ancient Greek, and Sanskrit. And he was the former um, director, curator at the B'nai B'rith Kutznik um, Museum here in DC. He's written over 130 articles, books, has done countless documentaries, has traveled the world, has um, spoken to, to many, many audiences, and we're really honored to have him here with us uh, today. So Ori, if you would, you pretty much wrote the book on this, so take it away. Um, I can't see myself. Am I, I? Are you seeing me or not? I don't Hold see on. you, but I hear you. I have, I, my video, I have my video on. I have demuted myself and I have my video on. And we I'm can hear into, you. Okay, well, since I, you don't have to see me, because uh, what <laughs> I look like is insignificant. Anyway, um, uh, of course, I missed the beginning of all of this, and I have not actually seen Judy's work in this conversation, and I only saw Simonita's just now, which I love. I've known Simonita's work from a much earlier time uh, in different directions, but my understanding was that uh, you were trying to address the question of Jewish art yes. and Jewish architecture. And I would um, say that there are a number of definitional issues that make that question fascinating. Um, and um, if there is a Jewish art par excellence, it certainly is one of asking questions and not necessarily questions with answers. So the question of Jewish art falls neatly into that category or falls neatly out of that category. Jewish art, you, one has to ask, first of all, what one means, what one's terms are conceptually. Are you talking about the art? And do you mean, therefore, symbols? Are you talking about style? Are you talking about subject? Are you talking about substance? The seven branch candelabrum, for example, is a the, the symbol par excellence that uh, over two millennia has been the consistent symbol of symbols in what might be called Jewish art, because it not only recalls the seven branch candelabrum in the destroyed temple in Jerusalem, but more significantly, the importance of sevenness within the Jewish tradition, going back to the commandment to keep the seventh day sacred and the connection between that and the idea that God rested on the seventh day. So there's this divine human covenantal connection that is implied by sevenness within the Jewish tradition and connected to the fact that that commandment was given when the Israelite forebears of the Jews were coming from slavery to freedom from Egypt to the promised land. So it connotes the responsibilities and the privileges of that kind of covenantal relationship. There are many other symbols that are less frequent. It's not until the end of the 19th century in a broad scale that, for example, the six-pointed star comes to be thought of as a Jewish symbol, as a much, much longer history. It's not Jewish, it's not Christian, it's not Muslim, it predates all of them. But it comes to be uh, a symbol as such. Uh, but you have are there stylistic issues? Um, would abstract art be a natural for a Jewish artist because of the presumed commandment not to create images, although that's a misunderstanding of that commandment? And the answer is it could be, except that you know Picasso wasn't Jewish and Barack wasn't Jewish. And while it's true, and I think there's a lot of Jewishness in Mark Rothko and Barnett Newman one side of the abstract expressionist equation. The other side is represented by people like Jackson Pollock and uh, Willem de Kooning. So abstraction is not per se a stylistic quality that, I, that, that automatically means Jewish. Subjects, what about Jerusalem? What about biblical subjects? Of course, the Hebrew Bible is shared by Jews and Christians. Indirectly, it becomes part or parts of it become part of Islam. So all of these different aspects of the art itself don't offer uh, an easy, obvious, and by no means absolute means of trying to define Jewish art. So maybe one has to turn to the artist. But then what about the artist? Does the artist have to be Jewish by birth? If someone converts to Judaism, does his or her art suddenly become Jewish? If one converts out of Judaism, does one's art suddenly cease to be Jewish? 
does it have to be Judaism of a certain type? So that if I'm not sufficiently orthodox, I don't qualify as a Jewish artist, or if I'm too orthodox, I don't. All of these questions um, are, are wonderful in that they provide no simple answer. And these are all the tip of, of, of many icebergs in terms of, of concept. If we think in terms not of concept, but of history, and we start with Jerusalem, so I keep coming back by, uh, by virtue of different angles to Simonita's work, and I, I'm seeing the uh, Damascus Gate before my eyes as I speak, Jerusalem, when we see it first taking shape in the Bible under the hands of David and Solomon, and Solomon builds a temple, the temple is not built by Israelites, it's built by Tyrians. And it's built in that style. It's called the longhouse style. And everything about it conforms to the Tyrian, the Northern Canaanite style of architecture. So is it Israelite because of who built it? Is it Israelite because of the style? None of the above. It's Israelite because it was paid for by an Israelite king who so soaked taxes out of the Israelites in order to provide a means of an instrument of connection between the Israelites and their concept of God. But then again, it's an Israelite temple. It's not Jewish at all, because in fact, the word Jewish appears nowhere, not only in the book of Kings, but nowhere in the Hebrew Bible. And because whereas the Jews consider themselves to be the heirs to the Israelite tradition, so do the Christians. So biblical, Hebrew biblical is not per se Jewish, although needless to say, it's the kind of subject matter to which Jews, but then so Christians also will be drawn. So when does Judaism begin? The Israelite tradition is preceded by Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, their wives, and they're not called Israelites, they're not called Jews. They're called Hebrews, which has a socioeconomic connotation. It means they move from place to place. It's neither ethnic nor spiritual in connotation or intention. So we go from Hebrew to Israelite, an Israelite kingdom that splits up, and ultimately what's left of it is the Judean kingdom. And the Judeans are not Jews, they're Judeans. The problem is that when the Judean tradition eventuates to become Judaism and Christianity in the first and second and third centuries, in the languages in play in that part of the world at that time, Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, Latin, you can't distinguish the word Judean from Jewish or Jew. It's the same word. It's Judaios in Greek. It's Judaios in Latin. It's Yehudé in Aramaic. It's Yehudi in Hebrew. So if I'm reading about something that's taking place during the time of Ezra in the fifth pre-Christian century in Hebrew, I might be inclined to translate the word Judean as Jew, but I would be wrong because features that define Judaism, like features that define Christianity, like the Bible that we read, like the festivals that we celebrate, the life cycle events that we celebrate and how we do so evolve and they're not all in place. The Hebrew Bible is not canonized until 140. The Christian Bible is not canonized until 395. So if we're trying to identify what it is that makes something Jewish, if we're looking on a historical progression, we have a long, long lead up until we get to Jewish, but you can't ignore that lead up. It's not accidental that every synagogue has symbolic elements that connote the temple in Jerusalem. They don't want to be the temple in Jerusalem, but they want to connote the temple in Jerusalem. They want to make that connection back. So Jewish art, as Jewish art, as opposed to Israelite or Judean art, is perhaps born 2,000 years ago. And Jewish art may be made by Jews, or it may not be, or it may be made by someone who becomes Jewish or ceases to be Jewish, is Simonida's depiction of Jerusalem Jewish art. If it were made not by Simonida, but by Yossi Stern, who used to do images of the Judean walls and Judean gates all the time in the 70s and 80s, because he was a Hungarian Jew who ended up living in Jerusalem, does that make his depictions of Jerusalem more Jewish than Simonida's depictions of Jerusalem? These kinds of questions are um, fascinating. And to end where I began, you know, they are questions without answers. So Robin, Jewish art um, or a Jewish art that cannot be denied is the art of asking questions without answers. Yeah. And all kinds of expressions in visual terms qualify 
as Jewish art through the ages and the criteria keep changing. It's one thing to talk about a painting. It's another thing to talk about a, a Havdalah Besamim box, a spice box for the end of Shabbat. It's used for a Jewish ritual. Nothing about it besides that makes it Jewish. In the medieval period, it wouldn't have been made by a Jewish artisan. Its style is not Jewish. Its symbolic language is not Jewish. Its use is, and yet it's part of what we call Judaica, which we must think of as emphatically Jewish. So whether I'm talking about a mosaic floor of a synagogue in the sixth century or Havdalah's box from the 16th century or an impressionist painting by Pizarro in the 19th century or an abstract expressionist painting by Rothko or work that is today work by Simonita or Judy Greenberg, my criteria will change and how I answer the question will therefore change. Wonderful. Ori, thank you very much. I know that um, Nadine wants to hop in here. So Nadine, over to you. Hi. So as you can see, the screen, the Zoom screen, the visual has frozen, but fortunately, audio is, will carry us on. So, and I see there's so many amazing questions. And I have a question for Ori that I wanted to just mention, ask, um, you know, in the Jewish religion, um, basically visual art, the depiction of humans and people, it's not something that's, um, well, one could say it's prohibited. May, uh, I, may I step right in? Yes, it's that's, not prohibited? It's absolutely wrong. It's not okay, prohibited. Okay, tell us. The second, the second commandment prohibits the creation of images that will be worshipped because the communities around the Israelites worshipped images. Uh -huh. So that which is beneath the sea, that which is in the skies, depictions that would be used for worship is the intention of that commandment. And in fact, across Jewish history, you have magnificent figurative art, for example, at Dura Europas in the middle of the third century. On the Absolutely. World. That and my question way, is, yes. and I totally, and it's great that you're correcting that. And I, but is there one of the expressions in within religion is architecture, did architecture become a greater focus? because people perceived that yeah. it was a safer area to, you know, to depict? Um, uh, I think not. I think actually architecture became very important only when it became feasible for Jews, first of all, to express themselves architecturally. Mm -hmm. Synagogues only by the middle of the 19th century really began to be visible on a large scale from the outside. I'm thinking 1884, the Via Farini's Gran Tempio in Florence as a classic example, all those magnificent synagogues across America from the 19th, 20th centuries. But it's not until the middle of the 20th century that in fact you start to find Jewish architects designing those synagogues. Sig Braver, right. known as the synagogue architect in the 50s, 60s. One of the most magnificent synagogues, of course, is the one in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania by Frank Lloyd Wright. He ain't Jewish. He made every effort to make every aspect of the synagogue resonate with Jewish symbolism. So I think it's just that as gradually Jews have become more and more uh, acclimated to producing visual art on, the, on a public scale, whether it's in painting or in sculpture, or in architecture, mm -hmm. that architecture becomes part of that. And of course, it flourishes spectacularly today, but it was slow in coming. Yes, that's, thank you so much. You bet. So there are so many questions in the chat and I'm going to try to ask a few of them. Um, uh, one of them is for Simonita. Uh, Simonita, you did not talk about the sure. Damascus Gate um which is very important to palestinians today um but has been a, a very important gate is there did you do a piece of and actually i'm looking it's on the here, screen in this, front of us it's the frozen one she did <laughs> it's you the forgot to mention do you want to tell me a bit very quickly because we have because we have so many we have so many questions could you just tell us a little bit a tiny bit about this particular image that happens to be on the screen of course. Uh, well, um, not only that we start from, from uh, 
2000 BC from the caves that are found in the nearby. And one of the first viaducts, you know, the water channels, the, the supply of water to the city was coming nearby too. This gate is important very much to Palestinians as well as the, the Jews, the Israelis. But again, what is the beauty for me of Jerusalem? Because there are so many nations and so many religions they are represented and living daily and cohabiting and um, hopefully finding their own way. And um, what I mention is because I know the time is limited, I really don't know. There are so many details about it. So there is an original uh, lower gate underneath Damascus. Um, it was worked with the Hadrian, Hadrian, the Roman Emperor Hadrian, Justinian I. They all left their signet ring, you know, in a building in their own um, architecture. Uh, Damascus Gate is very important because of the turrets. Um, they are not represented everywhere around the, 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 the city that goes around. Um, but they're actually very important in defense. Um, the stones are also very interesting. Um, most of the gates and the, the wall in between that varies on certain parts in the height um, are built for sometimes five or six different uh, types of the stones and different sizes. Why? Um, Turks had a very strange habit when they come and they start their architectural project. They, they borrow the stones from neighboring uh, monasteries, synagogues, whatever they find. Um, houses, abandoned houses, they were very... Um, <laughs> one, one has to remember that they are really a nomad tribe by, 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 by the nature, by the genes. By, so they, they were very utilitarian. They, they would pick things and make things out of them. <laughs> they were first Dadaists, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> so um, yeah, the Maskan Gate is very important for really, really everybody. So for all of them, um, I think that Jaffa Eastern Gate and the Maskan Gate would have a very, very uh, rich history and a background. Thank uh, you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Judy, I'd like to ask you a question too. Um, and it's from Mindy Wazow, who is a wonderful artist who we know who, who's now living in Israel. Must be late for her right now. Um, she wanted to know if you were thinking about, and I don't think this is a hard question, but um, are you thinking about incorporating paint into your collages uh, in the future? Because you started out as a painter. <laughs> Hello, Mindy. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. I can't seem to get myself to go back to paint. Don't ask me why. One of the things I have been doing are using acrylic markers, um, but I've been steering away from paint. So if this could change, I could, I could email you next week and tell you that I'm working uh, <laughs> some paint or something into it. But I'm, I'm really... I, I'm seeing everything through the eyes of collage. Great. Right now. Okay. Okay. Great. So I have one more question for both of you, and that was: both of your art has incredible artistic detail, and, and particularly Simonita, you have incredible architectural. But they both have architectural detail, really, just a very different kind of of concept of architectural. Um, how long did it take each of you, pick one work uh, that, you, that you showed today? Can you tell us how long it took you to, 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 to do all, to do it, to make it? Because with all that detail, Simonina, how long did it take you to make this piece of Damascus Gate? Oops. Oh, I can't hear you. You have to unmute yourself, Simonita. You're muted. You're, you're, mute. you're muted. Sorry. Okay. Um, considering that I had to wait some days to for adhesives to to dry, 
Uh, I love to work on a handmade paper, but I have to be very careful about as acidity and what I'm doing with it, especially when I'm putting, you know, the leaf. Uh, I would say a week and a half. Great. And how about you, Judy? Yeah, it's interesting you're asking that question because <clears throat> I think when people look at my work, they think, oh, she probably did that in two hours. You just cut and you paste. It is a long process um, and there is a lot of detail and there's a lot of reworking areas and working over areas. Um, it takes me anywhere between a week and two weeks. Um, working, I would say three, three days a week or four days a week. Um, it, it just, it really just depends. I think that the, the uh, January 20th one did not take me as long because I, I sort of had a preconceived idea of, of what I wanted to express and it came out quickly. Great, thank you. Um, it is almost 5.30 and um, I just wanted to, first of all, thank all of you. Thank you, Ori, for telling us, talking to us about what is Jewish art and tying this all together about art and architecture. And I wanna thank our artists Sumita and Judy for, first of all, taking the time to make all this beautiful art and to share it with us today. And I want to thank Robin Strongin, my co-founder here of the gallery. We're really excited about this gallery and being able to show you art and have you meet artists at some of our events and also talk to thinkers about how the art all fits together. Um, I want to encourage you, please, to go to Moment Mag dot com slash gallery so you can look at and there's so many questions um, you can also email us you'll see there's an email there you can email any questions that we didn't get to and I couldn't get to all these questions I apologize and there's so many good ones so go there and please email your questions and we will answer them for you we'll have the artists answer them for you and um, you can also again support these two amazing artists by buying their art. Their, their, these pieces were made to be sell, sold um, and you support them. And you also support Moment Magazine and the, the whole Zuminar project that we do and all of our work, all of our very important work. So this is a way where you can have beautiful art, find, buy beautiful art for your homes and your offices and um, also support really people really art, art artists and support good cause. And um, I just wanna say that the link is posted. And again, if you have any questions about the gallery, momentmag go to momentmag slash gallery.com. Also, you can call 202-363-6422. Someone is there right now. John is there right now to answer any questions. Um, Robin, you have anything you'd like to add? I just wanna, and something for everybody, please go through Nadine's open gate for you and look at the art and think how meaningful Judy's and, 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 and the Jerusalem and everything is so important. It is so new. So help Nadine's gate um, really be fruitful. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs> Thank you. And we apologize for, we've never had a, a, a visual freeze before, but luckily we all got to hear each other and speak and spend this lovely afternoon together. Thank you so much.